afternoon on a test of delegates and ladies and gentlemen. It is a great honor and pleasure to welcome all the delegates for this online clinical pathological conference at the 67 Myanmar Medical Conference. I would like to thank the organizing and academic committees for allowing me to co chair this session with Professor Dr. Edith. As Sir William Osler, Canadian physician and one of the four founding professors of John Hopkins Hospital, has quoted, as is our pathology, so is our practice. Understanding basic pathophysiology, anatomic pathology, histopathology, and other disciplines in pathology is essential for good clinical practice. Autopsies have played an important role for the 19th century pathologists, providing opportunities for clinical pathologic correlation. By the early 20th century, pathology testing evolved very quickly, including immunological techniques such as immunophenotyping, enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay, molecular techniques such as polymerase chain reaction, description fragment and polymorphism, new generation sequencing, fluorescent and cytohypothetization research, as well as genetic techniques. These tests are complicated and additional expertise are needed for interpretation as well as for the technical details. Role of pathology has extended from prevention to diagnosis prognosis, choice of treatment, response to treatment at clinical as well as molecular level. Clinical pathological conferences have been in practice for more than 100 years and was introduced in Boston by Harvard internist Dr. Richard Cabot. CPC is a case-based method of teaching learning medicine. It illustrates the logical measured consideration of a differential diagnosis and to evaluate patients. It is a dynamic tool of teaching that not only offers clinical pathological correlation, but also serves to build clinical pathological competence. It provides a platform for intellectual interaction among different disciplines, especially pathologists and clinical scientists. The process about case presentations and diagnosis data, discussion of differential diagnosis, logically narrowing the list to few probable diagnoses, and eventually teaching at a final diagnosis and its brief discussion. In today's CPC, we have chosen a very interesting case from clinical Rheumatology Department of North Oklahoma General Hospital and the postmortem and other investigations were done by pathologists from North Oklahoma General and Teaching Hospital as well as University of Medicine to Pathology Department. We would like to provide active participation of delegates in discussion to make this session a multidisciplinary interactive academic studies, enjoyable and beneficial for all of the delegates. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, our delegates. And first of all, uh, on behalf of the Mass Society of Hematology, I would like to thank the organizers for allowing us to participate in this very interesting session of the 67th Mass Medical a 67 conference of the Human Medical Association. And indeed, it is an honor for us. Um, I value postmortem examinations since our days as a third family students, where we are introduced to postmortem by the Baltus Colonel Jamali of DSDH with the introductory words saying that this is the place where. Death teaches the living. 
And I still remember the exciting postmodern teachings of Professor Uta Ang and later by Xia Unyunbei during our student days. When we began house officer at the North of La Bajana Hospital, our house surgeon daily report was not complete without the postmodern findings uh, of the patients who expired that night until Professor Unyabu. When I become a hematologist, we all inspire uh, the works of uh, Professor Reina, uh, who is our mentor and a role model. And as a lifelong learner, he showed us an example on how he is improve our clinical care of next patients by learning from this case. So today, uh, we have prepared a case, hoping that we could provide a better care for few, our future patients. So I'd like to invite Dr. Jinrechna to start the clinical part. Good afternoon, Madam Chairperson, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Dr. Yuma Han from Department of Clinical Hematology, Lord of Lapa General Hospital. And today I'd like to present a case of a <clears throat> so may I present a case of a 23 years old lady, a base guitarist and a university student, presented in December 2018 with fever and cough on and off for one month. There was anemic symptoms and skin bleeding, and she's been a recreational drug user for four years. Initial, initial investigation revealed pancytopenia with low radic count, with high ESR and normal ODH. All our screening were non-reactive. The NA screening was negative. The and real function were normal. We draw and only not efficient. Connected tissue screening was not significant and low organomegaly. Bomber examination was done and it revealed hypocellular marrow with increased fat spaces, cellularity less than 5% with depressed hemoboysis with residual lymphocytes, abnormal cells and fibrosis was not seen, compatible with severe aplastic anemia. Surface ratio showed obesities in right upper lobe, sputum for AFB was not detected. So she was diagnosed as severe aplastic anemia with smear negative boundary DB. So NDDB was studied. And during 2019, she uh, needed frequent hospitalization for uh, anemia, thrombocytopenia, because causing leukotudinous bleeding and neutropenic fever. Her hemoglobin dropped to the lowest value of about 2.5. Uh, absolute neutrophic count was dropped to lowest value of 0.06, that was very severe neutropenia, and lowest killing count was 2. The bar and real function and the early age were within normal. In April 2019, CT test was done and revealed as pulmonary tuberculosis. Genius spot was done in August 2019, but it revealed error after two times of testing, so NDTV treatment was extended to nine months. There was radiological improvement after NDTV, but her cytopenia her was not recovered. In March 2020, she admitted for a high fever with septic shock, not responded to broad spectrum antibiotics. And this is this was for a chest X-ray at the time, but there was no speed reduction at the time. We consulted with chest physician and was suggested to continue antibiotics and to research the response. Uh, we uh, did Bomer examination again, and uh, Bomer reviewed hypocellular with macrophage activation, severe anemia with uh, neutrophils with cytoplasmic vacuoles and normal lymphocytes. And there are some small round cells in clusters, and they are not likely as our uh, hemorrhoidous cells. And we suspected these cells being like likely to be G cells. So we did inject in stain of the bomberous smear, and although not like typical features, and her fungal serology and love of fungal culture later turned out to be negative, we managed her as fungal infiltration to bone marrow with prolonged immunosuppression. So we continued the broad spectrum antibiotics and gave her systemic antifungal, unphotoracin B for a total of four weeks, 
and coriconazole for a total of three months and other supportive measures. Patient responded to treatment, temperature subsided and increased well-being. And there was a radiological improvement after antifungal, and we re-examined the bone marrow and uh, the yeast like cells uh, not, cannot, could not be seen, no more yeast like cells. In April 2020, uh, she got high fever, tenderness, and rebound tenderness in RIF. After some review, acute appendicitis, with conservative management, abdominal pain and temperature was fluctuating. And we checked ultrasound in May, reviewed seal perforation with pendicular abscess formation and also abscess in right paracolic gutter. So we discussed with surgeon and with support of single donor platelet and granulocyte transmission, operation was done and it was found to be appendicitis with seagull perforation. Appendicectomy and primary repair of the cecum was done and the biopsy revealed as subacute appendicitis. Patient's condition gradually improved after operation, but her cytopenia persisted, now responded to thrombopoidin receptor agonist, and she experienced occasional gum bleeding epistasis and she had poor quality of life. So we decided to give her immunosuppressive therapy for the plastic media. So on 15 July 2020, we started infusion of antithymocyclobulin low dose together with power or cyclosporin and ionic prophylaxis. After ADG, uh, with support of uh, granulocyte growth factor, her uh, absolute neutrophil count was improved. On day 13 post ADG, she got high fever and uh, her blood count dropped, and we managed her as sepsis with cross-spectrum antibiotics, including galvanin, and with this management, her temperature subsided. On post, in August, on post ATG day 34, she developed high fever again up to 104 degree Fahrenheit with high CRP and ESR with her neutrophil and lymphocyte gum dropping and very high CRP. And this is this was her chest X-ray at the time. We gave her broad spectrum antibiotics and also systemic antifungal. And we discussed with her chest physician and NDDB was studied. So her temperature was uh, normal during the third week post ATG and rises in the fourth week, but subsided with antibiotics. And then began high swinging temperature in during the fifth week of post ATG, then subsided again and in the third week, the temperature higher again up to 140 degrees Fahrenheit. On post ATG day 43, uh, she got fever and at first her body signs were stable, but at that night, she got this near at rest Temperature high up to 140 degrees Fahrenheit, and there were bilateral basal fluctuations in lungs, as we were to drop to 89%. Although our management with oxygen support, uh, anticoagulation, uh, antibiotics, and antifungals, patient deteriorated. She caught severe dyspnea, hyperventilation, and we lost the patient at, in, in the early, early morning next day. And the cause of death was given as acute respiratory distress syndrome with septicemia underlying, very severe elastic pneumonia post ATG day 44. So I presented a 23 years female, a case of very severe elastic pneumonia with Cox lung, who experienced prolonged protracted illness. She received immunosuppressive therapy for elastic pneumonia and got high fever with very high CRB in post ATG fifth week and expired with acute respiratory distress. So may I invite our pathology colleagues to present post-mortem findings of the case. Good afternoon, honorable chairperson and ladies and gentlemen. I am Dr. Tutan Lasso, Department of Pathology, North Lama General and Kitchen Hospital. Now I would like to present the post-mortem findings of the case. 23 years old lady from the Department of Clinical Hematology Unit, now our general edition hospital was a fire at 28 August 2020 with the ARDS such that an analyzing and very severe elastic anemia communicated by TB, fungi, and bacteria infection. On a standard appearance, a young woman with every weight and height, she has slight pain, short jaundice, mad pain, and bruises on both extremity or abdomen. There are two scar and bit line and right hypochondrial region. Opening of thoracic cavity, ribs and scanners are 
not remarkable. And on opening of the chest wall, there's a heating on the right upper lobe and with the lower the limbs to the anterior chest wall. On opening of the pleura, they were dusty double fluid amounting 300 to 400 mm. Right limb, right limb showing that extensive fibrosis and consolidation at the lower lobe. It weighed 300 gram and it may be adhered to the chest wall by upper and middle lobe. And there, there was a yellowish necrosis extending into the right main bronchus. Also, small cavitation measuring 3 into 2 cm weight gives us necrosis. This is a gas section of the right limb of the upper lobe showing yellowish gaseous material within the cavitation. Left limb shows small in diameter. It weighs 220 grams, congestion only on gas section. This is the gas section of the left limb. This is a microscopic appearance of the head. It weighs 310 grams. No period on pericardian set and but decay all over the pericardian. Aside from that, there's no other anomaly in the head mass set, but then greater set. On opening of the abdominal cavity, small amount of free fluid only are noted. Levi might be enlarged. It weighs 2,500 grams, 20 into 20 into 8 inches in greater dimension, enlarged, and it occupies the whole abdomen. On externally, Gala is direct appearance and they also set capsular hemorrhage. This is a serious cut section of the liver bearing chyma showing multiple dead brown area alternating with the big gray area forming that mat appearance. This is the cut section of the spleen. It weighs 100 grams. It's, it's salt and congested on cut section, but not septic. This is the right kidney. It weighs 200 grams. On capsular surface, there is a mat particular hemorrhage spot. On cut section, there were big orders with direct right congestion medulla and distant cortical medulla junction indicating the shock. Both cranial glands show no significant growth finding. Open your the cranial cavity, scar will show no bony pathology. You are thick and saturated medulla is just 3 and 3 cm on right bridal region. This is the linear pattern of saturated hemorrhage measuring 4 into 1 cm in transtendorial area. Cassation of the brain show features of several edema. Apart from that, there is no features of no intracellular hemorrhage. On examination of the little urinary system was also done, but there is no abnormal pathological finding. So our our postmodern preliminary diagnosis was pulmonary coagulus infection with chronic passive vena congestion, lens, liver, and spleen, and short kidney, and also subtular hematoma. We took the tissue, tissue for the histopathological examination. This is a global view of the lens. It's showing the numerous soft tube bucket composed of thick amorphous granular material, easy and necrosis with lens and giant set, and many soft tube bucket are noted in the lens and primer rather than two head tube buckets are noted. And in area with in area apart from the two bucket, there were infiltration of the macrophages in the lens bearing chyma in, in such a taken from the bone lens and background boundary alveolar space that show boundary destruction. This is the infiltration macrophages ingesting the brown staining material in their cytoplasm. And also this session show alveolar septal damage. So this is your area show, alveolar septal damage with infiltrated microphages. We stain the cell and stain for acetyl line. No acetyl line was detected. And also we did the bar staining for ion, ion for microphages. And there is a brown staining order ion in there in this microphages. Head masses show no features of pathological anomalies. Liver, liver show, liver parenchyma show. Deposition of the hemosiderite, deposition in the hepatocyte and also gaffa cell. Slain show deposition of the microphages. Session from the kidney show features of acute tubular necrosis. 
ဒီတခါကျမှာကျမတို့ဟာဒီအင်ထာဘ်ဒေါနလ်အက်ဆက်စ်နဲ့နောက်ဆုံးမှာစီကန်ပေါ်ဖိုရေးရှင်းဖြ
ပြီးပြီးရောင်ဟာကျမတို့နျူထရိုဖစ်ကောင်စီရာရန်ပြီးရောင်အင်ပရိုဖ်လေအင်ပရိုဖ်ဖြစ်လာပါတယ်မင်
The diagnosis and scope of that cultivation look uh, to my knowledge. I got it. The cause of that, the diagnosis and cause of that. ကိုယ်ပါရှင်အာတွေ့ရဒီအမိတိကောစတက်ကတော့အခြေရဲစီဒီဒစကပ်စင်ဒရိုးမီတောင်းတစ်ပါလေအဲဒီလာတမိတ
down to the power. And then, my mother can take it down on one, he took the power, he looked like he looked like he did that. And then, he got the power to do London TV. The mother, you took the point to up, we are very severe, and you took the other side. And then, you took the point to, uh, เอ่อเอ่อการเนาะเนเนนี่เจอแล้วก็ว่าขึ้นมาเป็นฮาร์สเตเบิลขึ้นมาไปเอ่อที่ตะพัสดุเอเดชั่นนี่ฟรีควัน